And then Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present here today. Uh, Deep Dive is a technology company. We're actually based uh, just about an hour from here. In fact, uh, I live just about 45 minutes from here, which makes it a, a fantastic venue to come out here because it's one of the few local publishing events that is uh, in my backyard. But even though we're a technology company and my background is technology, I, I, I was reminded of how much I've learned and become assimilated to the publishing industry in the last few years when uh, last night I got to spend the night at home. Uh, and unfortunately, my, my six-year-old son had a stomach virus. And for those parents that know what that's like, uh, the bathroom was like a war zone. <laughs> and around 3 o'clock in the morning, I was like, man, I wish this was in Frankfurt. <laughs> 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 I have been fully assimilated by the Borg. Uh, so uh, just to give you a little bit of background for those of you that, that are not familiar with, with, with Deep Dive, um, we are an online article rental service. So we've partnered with a lot of publishers to reach really uh, what we refer to as the unaffiliated user, the, that user that's no longer affiliated uh, with an academic library institution. Uh, some would call them consumers. We think of them as knowledge workers, as information professionals, typically uh, sometimes individuals, but often at small to mid-sized companies, startups, where they've left their academic credentials behind to go into the professional workforce or into the corporate workforce, I should say. And what we do is we, we've created a type of Spotify for research experience where the users can rent the article uh, for, for a, a limited amount in return for limited access, meaning it's a read-only uh, access, no print, no download, and it's all access through the browser, no DRM either. Uh, articles expire after a certain amount of time, and, and because of the limited access, uh, the price is very limited. You could rent uh, on an a la carte basis, or you can rent on a monthly subscription basis uh, for prices that become within their reach. Uh, we work with a lot of partners. Uh, we work with over 100 publishers and have, have aggregated over 8 million articles that are rentable that would normally be behind a paywall. Uh, but we also have uh, millions and millions of open access articles as well, from PLOS to Archive to uh, PMC to so forth and so forth. Uh, and what I think has led to this, this, this growth in our relationships has been that uh, so far, uh, you know, we've seen zero evidence of any type of cannibalization. That what, what looks to be happening is that the users that are accessing Deep Dive service and this rental model uh, appear to be distinctly different users from those that are academic institutional users. They're not, one is not replacing the other. Uh, Joe touched upon this, and I thought I'd talk about some of the types of freemium tactics out there. And as, as Joe mentioned, really, freemium is a form of product sampling, but it, ha but it has some some unique characteristics to it, but there's many different forms of that. And, uh, and some of them are what we would refer to as seat-limited freemium tactics, meaning like up to a certain number of users are free. QuickBooks does this. Google, if we all, anyone use Google Apps for businesses, it's for, if you're a startup, you get a certain number of users for free, and then at some point, uh, you then need to, to, to upgrade. There's also customer type limited, which also could be geographic type limited. In Silicon Valley, there are a lot of law firms that offer services, maybe not quite for free, but at heavily discounted rates for startups, so that when the startups take off, they then get into a more normal retained type of billing arrangement. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, publishers do this as well. You reach certain developing markets with, with different pricing uh, uh, than you do in more mature markets. Uh, the, the next two I'm going to mention are ones that are probably most common that we see for the broad audience, the, 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 the mass market. One is time limited. Uh, you get a free trial. After a certain amount of time, you get to then uh, decide whether you want to pay for it or not. Norton is very successful at this for antivirus software. You download the software, you get to use it for a month, and then uh, after a month, you get reminded that it's no longer available. Then there's also feature limited. Uh, the basic service, Skype. Get to use it for free indefinitely, but if you want the advanced functionality, the advanced features, uh, then, it, then you have to upgrade to the premium account. And I'd argue that, that the, the publishing industry is, is already doing some of these types of things. Uh, I touched upon some of the things we're doing ge geographically, but also uh, when you think about the abstract, the abstract is a freemium model. Right? It, it's a way to read the article or a summary of the article on your site, no questions asked, and then the user can decide whether they want to upgrade and do pay-per-view or subscribe. So these are tactics that we sort of see all around us uh, when we sort of take them for granted. But uh, they actually, uh, rather, we, we do them, see them all around us. We don't really notice them until we start to think about how could we apply them to our business. And what makes freemium a little bit unique from a traditional product sampling, giving away you know, chocolate samples at, at Whole Foods, 
uh, is that there's some uh, characteristics to it. One is it, it lets you reach a very large audience. That, that's a critical component of this because you're trying to basically introduce as many people as you can to your offering. Of course, a prerequisite for that, it has to have very low marginal cost. And that's one of the problems that's always hindered traditional marketers is you can't give away millions and millions of small pieces of chocolate. Some, someone's got to hand them out. Someone's got to make the chocolate. There's actual you know, costs associated with that. The other piece is that the free version has to have genuine value to the user. You, it, there, there has to be some real reflection of the value that they're going to get should they upgrade. Uh, and they can't just be giving something away for free that nobody really appreciates. Uh, then, of course, there's a critical emphasis on the metrics. Well, when you're dealing with large numbers of users, uh, you have to understand how they're flowing through the funnel. And when you're dealing with a large number of users, unlike a product sampler handing things out, uh, you have to basically uh, do analysis by large amounts of data. You can't just get one user's feedback to give you an, some estimate as to how well it's doing. Conversely, of course, you get a lot more data back. When, when, when companies do product sampling, they don't know who's receiving the sample. They don't know how much they really liked it. They don't know whether they came back and bought as a result of it. All of this data now becomes available at your, at your fingertips to take advantage of to try and drive the model. Uh, and this leads to, of course, a deep understanding of, of the user, to know what really motivates them, uh, what part of the feature can be free, what part can be paid for, how many users can be free, how many users do you, do you begin to start to charge. And uh, you know, the SurveyMonkey example is a classic example of that. So here's the question then, is, is there a analogy or can this model, this, and I'll say marketing model, not business model. This is just a marketing program. Can it be applied to scholarly publishing? Well, is there a large addressable audience? The answer, I think, is yes. Uh, there's about 250 million knowledge workers, a lot of educated users worldwide. Is, the, is there a low marginal cost? Yes, marginal cost. Again, variable cost, not fixed, right? Web, PDF, to deliver the incremental article, fairly low cost. Is the free version uh, provide genuine value? Uh, abstracts, maybe, maybe not, right? Maybe uh, archives, in some cases they're provided for free, other cases maybe not. Is there good metrics? Uh, I think on downloads, definitely. I think most publishers have a very good understanding of just how many downloads are taking place on their site. On the other measures, the things that happen on, above the funnel, how much traffic, what, you know, what items are being clicked on, what's the conversion, what's the abandonment rate. Uh, Probably less so for many for many publishers, and then is there a deep understanding of the of the of the customer, for for the for some of the audience librarians and authors? I think clearly yes. Uh, for the end user and particularly the unaffiliated user, uh, I think less so. So this leads to the question of well, what's to to pull this model off? Clearly, there's some areas that are that support the model, but there's some other areas where there's going to be some some new capabilities required. So let's. I thought I'd do a case study, and, and we're, we're a perfect example of that because we've got all the data. So let me tell you what we've been trying out. We've done lots of freemium offers since our inception, from two articles for free, five articles for free, and so forth and so forth. The one that we had been using most recently was a free trial. So this is one where you, you register with an email address and a credit card. Uh, you get to use our monthly subscription for two weeks for free. So with that, you basically get a run of the site. You can look at anything you want. Uh, but after two weeks, your access uh, is turned off. Uh, and if you want to then use it beyond it, you've got to pay up, and you can then cancel it any time afterwards. But, but that's the hook. So the, there's some real advantages to this type of freemium model. Uh, one is that it's fairly easy to track. You know when people register. And then because it cuts off automatically, you know exactly <laughs> should they decide to upgrade or not. You also, through use of putting a credit card requirement in the registration, are really narrowing your audience to those most willing to self-select and pay up. Uh, conversely, of course, as you'll see in the, the cons, is you run the risk of alienating potential users because of the hurdle you put onto it. Uh, but this becomes, in terms of monetization, one that's fairly straightforward and easy to implement uh, because you can just see, is it working or is it not working? There's not a lot of repeat marking that, that uh, is, is required, although, of course, it's better. The cons is that the, the, the offer can be perceived as weak. Uh, one a user may use it for a, a day or a couple of days. They may need they may need it again later, but now it's the trial is over. So you've cut them off before they've really got a chance to fully immerse themselves. 
Uh, Salesforce uses this model, it works for them, but one of the biggest complaints for Salesforce users is the salespeople use it, but by the time they really get trained up in it, the free trial is over. And they don't really get a chance to take advantage of all the stuff they have to do to use the service well. And then, of course, when you do ask for a credit card, you know you're going to weed a lot of people out. Uh, and just in terms of mission, it also means for a company like Deep Dive or for, for all of you, it means we're, we're reducing the audience that we could possibly serve, delight, disseminate information to. We're, we're basically having our monetization goals compete with our dissemination goals. So what we wanted to try and do is to apply a different technique, and, and we just announced this uh, earlier this week, and that's, and that's one where it's, uh, it's a, uh, a feature-based free. So the test that we did was where uh, the free trial is no longer two weeks and you're out. It's you can look at any article you want, but only for five minutes. It's a free preview now. So it's much more like the basic service is free, then you have to pay to upgrade, like, uh, like Skype, for example. Uh, we, we took away the credit card uh, requirement, so you just an email and password. Uh, and then if you wanted to, then you can upgrade to one of our monthly plans or even do a pay-per-view download uh, if you wanted to. Uh, the pros, it, a much more wider adoption. More users have an opportunity to try it. We also think, and I'll touch upon this later on, is that uh, something like this enables social networking, social sharing, meaning that when you let someone experience the full service for free, it now lets other people share it, refer it, virally send it out to other people because the people you send it to can actually take advantage of it now. And normally these models lead to much higher retention because when people decide to upgrade, it's a very well-educated, well-informed decision, and uh, as a result, they stay on longer. The cons are that you have run the risk of cannibalization, that for some users that you now give five minutes for free, that may be all they really need, and so then they will have no, they'll have no impetus to upgrade. Uh, it puts a lot more pressure on the organization on the metrics uh, because now you are basically having to, to test not just did they upgrade yes or no but what features what level of features might be causing the upgrade or not the upgrade to take place uh, it also means from a product development standpoint uh, there's more pressure on having distinctly uh, differentiated features this is free this is not free is a lot is a lot more difficult than it's the same thing for free but you just get to try it for a few days uh, and as a result the two combined require then a lot more emphasis on A-B testing, on, on rapid release, rapid, you know, sort of testing analytics, and then, and then release of new features or new insights to validate the assumptions. Uh, so how it works uh, on our site is you, you can come to an article page, you can register for free, you put in your email address or password, we've asked, we've, or, or sign in with your Facebook account, uh, and then once you do so, uh, then you have five minutes where you can uh, read only the article, so the article is sort of streamed into the browser. Uh, but one thing we also changed in our, in our user interface design is with this release, uh, we also emphasize a lot more things such as article details. In other words, uh, making uh, the references to the article much more readily available and not being uh, sort of hidden at the bottom of the article, uh, which we think will lead to more discovery and people going from the article that they read for five minutes, then they read the next article for five minutes, and at some point they say, you know what, I should just pay. And also, because of the free nature of the ability to read the whole article, uh, we, we, we emphasize more the Facebook, the Twitter, the ability to actually share it and disseminate it socially. Uh, so I thought I'd share some results with you. Uh, we look at, you know, basically two primary channels. Uh, we look at visitors to our site that come from Google and visitors to our site that come from our publisher partners. And most of our partners uh, place deep dive rental links, almost like an advertisement, on their uh, abstract pages so that the user, and this is only shown to non-subscribers, so a non-subscriber user can see that the article can be purchased for this price so they can click and come to deep dive and try our service out and rent it instead. Um, and you can see what, our, what our, uh, our old free trial registration rates look like. Uh, and then when we launched the five minute preview, uh, the results just really have taken off. Uh, and it's, it's dramatic. And, and, it, I, and I think some of this uh, starts to really uh, lead to some interesting insights and questions as to who these users are and why they're behaving this way. I think for, for uh, many in the industry, there's, there's, there's an unknown to the Google visitor. Are they really sophisticated enough to be reading this? Or when they come to my site and they, and they abandon, they, you know, they, they don't end up purchasing the article. Is that an indication that the price was too high? Or is that an indication that really their interest wasn't that high in the first place and the price just simply self-selects them out? 
Uh, these response rates, uh, I have not seen 6% uh, Google response rates from many other freemium models that I've re looked at. It's a pretty high registration rate for a Google visitor who's obviously a very uh, uh, random, potentially random visitor. What it obviously suggests is that they're not so random. And then to get, you know, uh, you know, 30 percent of visitors from a publisher site, I think that also says, you know, the audience on your site clearly is interested in this. They, they wouldn't be there and they're clearly interested in getting beyond the abstract and that's sort of what we're trying to accomplish here. So, so that's what, as we look at this, it starts to raise questions of, well, you know, how big do we think this audience really is? And what's the real level of interest and expertise of this audience? Uh, what we've started to draw a picture on for ourselves is, is we, we believe that this is an, this new freemium model or offering uh, clearly represents a good value proposition to the user. They wouldn't register otherwise. But I think that we also married it very well with a really good user interface design that the user really understands, you know, most users don't know what an article rental is, much less a five minute preview. So there's a lot of thought went into, went into how we present that to the user, how we message it. Uh, we had a lot of discussions with users and with, with our partners about should it be five minutes, three minutes, ten minutes, what, what should that be? And, uh, and uh, it looks like I mean, we've had virtually no pushback from users on five minutes is too short. Uh, that being said, we're not celebrating anything just yet. Uh, these are free trial registration rates. These are not payment monetization conversion rates yet. So we need to see how this plays out. And our expectation is that uh, if this works well, uh, users will upgrade over time, that they will repeat use these five minute previews to, to some point of frustration when they say, I should just pay. And that could take place over days, weeks, months, we don't know. That's, we've got some assumptions that we've modeled, but we don't know and we won't know until, until this plays out a little longer. One thing we did see that was interesting though is that for certain more, uh, I won't say impulse decisions, but certain more real-time decisions, which is how many people do a five-minute preview and then want to buy the article. Uh, we do sell PDFs on our site. It's not the majority by any stretch of the means of the type of usage we see on our site. Most users are obviously renting, but we do see some PDF activity, and that activity has doubled since we've launched this out. So uh, there is some strong early indication that this is a really good product sampling technique. Uh, the last piece I, I want to touch upon and then just uh, digress into a little bit more macro things, is just what we're seeing on the social side. And these are just the, uh, the Facebook activity that we're seeing. Now granted, this is Facebook users don't match the demographics of our normal user, but we are seeing just, you know, hockey stick type activity, which is not something you normally, we would not normally see within this market. Uh, and that leads to questions of like, is science really social? There's been uh, a lot of questions as to just you know, social networking and Facebook for Science, and does, is there really that type of, of engagement from this type of information professional, scientific researcher, whoever that might be? And one thing that we, we, we saw from this, re from this report was that when you normalize for types of articles that are shared on a per 100 article basis, let's say, so normalizing it, across all the different categories of article types, from food to fitness to health to travel to sports, science articles are actually the most shared articles of any category. So people are actually recommending these to their friends, whether that be liking it, tweeting it, emailing it, whatever it might be. But conversely, it's actually among the least clicked articles. Right? So people share it, but, but the people that receive it don't do anything with it. And in fact, it's one of only two where there are fewer clicks than there are shares on a percentage basis. And that's, that's almost like the opposite of viral, right? <laughs> I mean, you look at politics, that's politics, is, that's the one right in the middle. At least some of these categories are pretty viral. And so it, it, it raises the question like, well, God, people really are sharing this stuff. Like, so maybe the behavior is, is social. In fact, actually, the whole genesis of the journal industry was a socially driven, you know, uh, impetus, right? How do we disseminate and share information with each other? Uh, and so there is an interest in it, but no one's really, but no one's really responding to it. And the question is, why is that? All right. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of reasons, but one of the thoughts that occurred to us when we see the activity on our site is maybe one of the reasons people don't click on these things is because they've been trained not to because they hit paywalls, right? So maybe if we could lower the paywall and lower the threshold, maybe that will actually lead to the type of viral that will actually broaden the dissemination. And I can tell you, <laughs> if, if 
freemium as a form of sampling is a relatively easy but maybe you know, uh, cost-effective way of getting audience. Viral is the most cost-effective way because it literally costs you nothing. So this is kind of interesting. I, I started to look at this and, and I encourage folks, uh, for those that uh, know Mary Meeker, uh, she works at Kleiner Perkins, which is one of the blue chip venture capital firms down here. She used to work at Morgan Stanley. She was the queen of the internet because she used to cover Amazon and at, at, uh, was a you know, key internet analyst back in the day. Uh, so she puts together an, uh, an annual internet report, and so uh, you can get them off of SlideShare, off of Kleiner's site. Uh, but this, the trends around social uh, and around just what's happening in terms of user behavior and technology is is worth paying attention to. And this is the amount of, and this is in this is in zettabytes. Uh, this is the amount of of global information that's being uh, created and shared. It's it's just staggering, and. Again, I know that there's some, always some questions that how does this apply, does this apply to us? And, and my recommendation would be to assume it does until proven otherwise because well, at least what I've learned is how we behave in our normal life is not altogether different than how we behave professionally. And in fact, if anything, we'd like them to be closer together. So uh, if people are sharing offline uh, in other channels, they probably would like to and will share in our disciplines. Now, we may think that that's not the case because as Americans, although I know we have a global audience here, but at least you know, in, in our, in our s small circle of this, Americans don't share that much relative to other countries. In fact, most developing countries relative to other developing countries don't share that much. But that's going to change, and that is changing. Uh, and when you look at just the growth of certain you know, ways in which people are going to be accessing our content and which, uh, which are directly faci facilitate sharing, I mean, we think that because everyone in this audience probably has a smartphone, that the world has smartphones. Well, that's not the case. Not yet. It will be. But still today, there's five times as many, or sorry, three, three and a half times as many uh, mobile phones as there are smartphones out there. There's huge upside that we still are not seeing, and we, but, but in, in my opinion, it's inevitable that we will see it. So putting that together to try and see, like, well, how does this compute for us? Is this an, something worth looking at? We think it is. So when I've, and I can do this from a bottom up or a top down. I could look at the total STM market and break it down one way, but let's just take it from a traffic perspective. We've talked to a number of our publisher partners and we've asked them how much traffic they get. And of that traffic, how much of that traffic is so-called Google traffic, unrecognizable, unaffiliated visitors, which, and they generally say it's about half. And when we talked to a lot of our partners, we basically did an estimate for the industry and said the industry probably gets about 4 billion visits, visits a year, and that about half of that are these unaffiliated visits. Just imagine 10% sign up, which is like what we're seeing for our freemium offering, and imagine 5% upgrade to some amount. That's 10 million users out there, which, by the way, is the same number of uh, scholarly users there are. There's about 12.5 million scholarly users out there. And we're saying, well, imagine there's 10 million unaffiliated, non-scholarly users out there. Imagine, would they, would they be willing to pay a hundred bucks a year, that's a billion dollars. And at some level you're like, okay, those look like big numbers, but a hundred, a 10 million new users represents a half a percent conversion rate off your website traffic. Five out of a thousand visitors. Right now, most publishers are seeing a conversion rate of, of to pay-per-view of about 0.1 percent. All right, one out of a thousand. So can we improve that conversion rate by letting people experience our offerings in an in a, in a easier way? Uh, and if you start to get into, oh, well, they pay $100 a year, well, that's two to three pay-per-views. It's not, we're not talking about having them break the bank. And when you start to do that, you say, well, okay, now we get to a decent number that actually would represent incremental market size. I mean, STM is about 10, so another billion dollars. Is that believable? If, is it, if it's off by a factor of, of, of uh, you know, by a, a total factor, then it's, only, it's still, for an industry going 5%, these numbers matter. Uh, and what we've seen so far, at least, is that they really appear to be incremental users. So the question then is, why not? So what we're seeing, just to wrap up, is we, we, we're starting to see some very interesting insights that speak to what we think is a really uh, uh, exciting opportunity. It will require some new competencies to, to, to get in this direction. But I think it's one that every publisher is thinking about already and is already starting to embrace around better data, better tracking, better analytics. Uh, I think it feeds into some of the macro, social, uh, and mobile trends that we're seeing. And again, I encourage you because what this really does, social is not just about, you know, we want to do it because our users want it. From a pure business perspective, it's a way for your users to talk about you in ways that you probably have never seen before. 
Uh, and this ties then to you know, a, a potentially large, attractive audience. And unaffiliated users, I, I encourage you not to think of them as consumers because we think of them as you know, you know, soccer moms and sports dads or something like that. No, th these are information professionals all around the world who seem to have a real interest in this. And I say that only just based on the registration rates we're seeing. And so can we imagine just monetizing a small percentage of those visitors? That could be something that's worth you know, strongly considering. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, look forward to talking with you.